Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Bridget Stevens. She's a Steve Irwin protege who fell in love with an orphan wombat, sold her properties, left her family and friends, and moved 2,500 kilometers to establish the only free-range, cage-free wombat sanctuary. Bridget and her friend Claire are the only people in the world who live within a community of wombats and are at the forefront of wombat advocacy. So first, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you very much for having me. So let's start by talking about who, what and who are wombats. Okay, wombats, they're native to Australia, and they are short, round, um, burrowing marsupials. They're the largest burrowing marsupial in the world. They are about a metre long and about a foot tall, and they are full of attitude. They live in large social groups, and, um, and their warrens are absolutely massive. And how, how much do they weigh? They can weigh up to about 32 kilos. But so we have had wombats in that are 50, 55 kilos, so they, can, they range quite, quite a bit. So for people in the U.S., that's 80 to 120 pounds. So it's, that's like the weight of a big dog. Yes, and they're full uh, of muscle. Mm. And um, so how many, how many species of wombat are there? There are three species. There's the northern hairy nose, the southern hairy nose, and the bare nose wombat. The bare nose wombat stands alone by itself. It um, is very, very different compared to the hairy nose wombat. It lives in a much wetter environment. It's mainly solitary. It's nowhere near as social as the southern or the northern hairy nose wombat. And um, its breeding cycles, everything is completely different. Whereas the southern and the northern hairy nose, they're cousins. And they live in semi-arid to arid environments, really harsh environments here in, in Australia. And they live in large social groups. They have, their burrow is massive, and they're extremely intelligent animals. And how massive is massive? Um, I have seen one that's, uh, one warren that has taken up 500 acres, um, and that had over 289 entrances. And uh, that would have to be the largest and one of the oldest wines uh, I think there are here in Australia. And how many, I mean, they're underground, so we can't tell for sure, but how many individuals do you think live probably in that, um, how, how big again was that? It was over 500 acres, 289 entrances. So how, how, many, how many individuals, just take a guess, how many individuals lived in that community? I would say 40. 40, that's... That. Oh, so they have like six entrances per, per person. Well, sometimes they'll all use the one entrance, um, and there's no rhyme or reason. I, just, I don't know why, and I don't know if we'll ever work out why. Um, they only use some holes, some entrances, and, um, and what my thoughts are is that, and what we've seen in our sanctuary, is that um, their job in, in nature is to infiltrate water into the water table, and so they'll have their main entrances, but then they dig all of these holes around it that actually infiltrate the water away from the entrance so that they've always got a clear run to get in and out. And then um, all of those holes then infiltrate the water into the water table. And before we go on, that's pretty interesting that you say that because I know prairie dogs are you know, tiny little burrowing animals in the United States who are also communal. And there is, it's just interesting to me, there's also a relationship between them and water because the, ah. the Indians of North America would say that the prairie dogs brought rain. And a lot of the, the Europeans thought that was just nonsense, but it ends up it's actually true that, um, that for somehow they, they actually do, I mean, there are statistical studies on this for what that's worth. That they actually do bring rain, so it's very interesting that two burrowing animals across the world affect. I guess maybe it's not so strange, but it is kind of interesting. Yes, very, very. I didn't know that. Um, so, so I want to talk in a moment about why they have burrows, but before we go there, um, how how are wombats doing in general? Um. They're, they're doing really badly, to be honest. There's so many different things that are going on with them. The northern hairy nose wombat is the most critically endangered large mammal in the world. I think the last count was around 300. They got down to 36 animals 
and uh, there's none in captivity, so they're trying to save an animal that they literally know nothing about behaviourally. Um, the bare-nosed wombats, they're also known as common wombats, but, you know, the name is obviously starting to change because it's, we've got to change people's perception about that. And their numbers are diminishing so rapidly just from psychotic mange, um, which is a disease, it's a, it's a mite that they get, and uh, we, we firmly believe it only affects stressed animals because we do see completely healthy animals and completely uh, disease-ridden animals living together in the same warren and one is not affected and the other one is. And then the southern hairy nose, which is the animals that we really specialise in, we've seen a 70% decline in the last 10 years and, and I, I've, seen more, I've seen more than that, you know, that's just as a whole, but uh, the areas that we go, I used to see 700 wombats in an afternoon five years ago, it was only five years ago, and now we're lucky to see two or three. Um, the population has just completely, totally and utterly dropped due to poor land management and culling. So even though the population's gone down by 70%, they're still being uh, intentionally killed? Yes. The, um, the, the, the amount of permits issued, destruction permits issued to kill these animals has gone up 509%. Because what's happened is that um, where they live, it's, it's just not viable for farming. You know, some years they will get as low as 30 mils of rain a year. So it's extremely dry. And uh, so people have gone in, tried to farm it, and then abandoned the land. But what they've done is they've killed out the, um, the sea bank. So there's no food for them, so all they're living off is toxic weed. So they've either got the option that they stay there and they die, or they move. And so a lot of animals, the older animals have stayed there, but a lot of the younger animals have moved um, next door, literally, to, to uh, their population. And the government's gone and got a $2.1 million grant to, re, to enhance that environment. And all of that environment is farmland. So the wombats are moving onto farmland. The government's enriching that area. It's encouraging more wombats to move in there. And, of course, the farmers are uh, killing the wombats subsequently. So the wombats, just to be clear, the wombats are being encouraged to move in to a place where they then get killed. Yes. Um, that sounds brilliant. Um, yes. Um, there's a so, lot of no logic with wombats. <laughs> well, I mean, frankly, there's a lot of no logic. In the United States, uh, we had a vice president a few years ago who said that fish don't actually need water. So, I mean, it's this is, oh. this is what we run into, you know? So... Yeah. Um, so let's back up again. And uh, what do what do wombats eat? They mainly eat native grasses. And um, so, do farmers hate them because the farmers uh, argue that the wombats are competing with sheep for grass, or wh what's their excuse? Yes, there's a, there's a couple. They say they damage fences. However, we've set up cameras on properties that um, have applied for destruction permits due to damage to fences and every single property they'd move sheep into paddocks with no water and it was the sheep going through the fences um, and then uh, they say that they cause erosion um, from their warrens which of course are a natural part of the environment and farming is far worse and what's the other one? Oh, that their machinery falls down the warrens um, so they're, they're the grounds that they, they get destruction permits to kill them so I'm just I'm just curious about this that um, in the United States they like to argue that prey dogs should be killed because cows and horses break their legs in the holes, which is completely untrue. It's that's simply untrue. Yes. yes. And yes. so, just out of curiosity, is there a single incident of a tractor falling into a warren and getting getting destroyed that you know of? Not that I know of. No. Mm -mm. Well. And I, and also there's definitely no. Um, broken legs or animals. In fact, we've got footage of animals taking shelter in their warrens um, from the extreme heat. Okay. I, wait, I, we need to back up a little bit because what sort of animals, how big are these holes? Because you say warrens, like what sort of animals are, are taking taking shelter in um, there? Mainly, mainly sheep. So it's big um, enough for a sheep have, to get in? Yes. Yeah, some of them, the really old warrens, and we're talking thousands of years old, you can walk in or even drive your car into the entrance. Um, but they're disappearing pretty rapidly now, um, so they can get absolutely massive. But they have to be really, really old. 
so uh, sorry to jump around so much. I just think this is no, so interesting. I, I, sorry, yeah, if I um... it's no, no, you're doing you're doing great. I just I just keep thinking of so how 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 widely uh, distributed were wombats prior to European conquest? Were they were they everywhere? Were they just in parts of it? No. Um... I mean, obviously, all three species have got different distribution, but for the southern hairy nosed wombat, they basically covered um, most of South Australia, um, you know, from about halfway down, but all the way across and into Western Australia and into New South Wales. Now there's five populations left. And what about the, the northern hairy nosed wombats who only, how many populations are, is, is that couple hundred wombats? Well, they were in one population. In the 80s, there was another population that was ignored um, and killed out by farmers. And then all of a sudden, you know, it was catastrophe when they realised there was only one population left of the species. And so what they've done is they've split the species up. They've split this group up into two different areas because they were concerned that if a fire or something came through, um, that they would wipe out a species. But that relocation was extremely unsuccessful. And... Um, so I think they're looking at doing that again, but uh, but I don't like the chances. And were the northern hairy-nosed wombats fairly well distributed prior to conquest too? Yes, they were. They were. They had a lot. They had quite a big distribution um, before European settlement. Um, so uh, you've mentioned the threat of direct killing by farmers and... Yes. Uh, you mentioned the mange, but can you talk just a little bit more about Is that an introduced mange, or was that always there and has just become epidemic? Well, well I mean, uh, we do things very differently, and what we're seeing is completely different compared to research. So it is believed that it was introduced by the European red fox. However, we have... Um, well, I, don't, I don't think that at all. I think it's actually a natural part in their environment, and they succumb to that when they're stressed. And, and I'm saying that is because in our sanctuaries, the mite survived without a host for 21 days in a warren. And so in our sanctuary, we have gone for three or four years with no mange, and then we'll have a wombat that's been surrendered to us, that's been a pet. And when they start to make that full transition, which is always their choice, to live in warrens, they obviously get stressed. And uh, as much as they can come inside and do whatever they like, they get that stress and they always succumb to mange. So we, we treat them. And then we bring wombats in that are completely, totally and utterly covered in mange. And our animals that are not stressed, they don't get that at all. So, um, so I think it's actually a natural part of the environment because there is no way for the mange or the mites get into the sanctuary without any hope. Right, right. Um, let's okay. So, what other threats are there to them besides the uh, direct killing and um, mange? You mentioned pets. Is capture for pet trade a a problem? Yes, it is. Um, so a lot of animals get uh, orphaned. Mainly, wombats are hunted for food um, here in South Australia, and then the babies, uh, the joeys, are given to the kids generally as um, in the communities as tools of trade so quite often they'll take them to a local roadhouse and um, trade them with tourists for money or or uh, alcohol and they, the wombats are tortured until the people actually pass over money and then um, quite often they end up in the wrong hands and they're raised they're so gentle and loving and kind until they start to get older and they want to go outside and then they become extremely destructive. And that's when we end up getting animals surrendered to us. And there's also a huge zoo trade, which is something that we don't support as well. Did you say, I, I didn't understand the word zoo or fur? Zoo, zoo trade. Right, okay. So there's, there's actually a program that takes in orphan wombats to sell them to zoos and demonstrators and, and we don't support that. Right. Um, um, so let's talk about the mange before we talk about other threats. Um, okay. Is there, is there, I mean, the obvious solution is to stop stressing the wombats. Um, are yes. there other solutions that are being proposed for the mange if it is being a significant killer of a species in 70% in decline? Yes. Um, for starters, there are 
key indicator to the environment. So obviously, in the environment is, is ideal, but that's a very large scale thing. Um, we tried in 2010, we set up a mange um, eradication program. So we used soft treatment flats, and that actually helped the wombat in the wild uh, without us having to bring them in. Um, and that was quite successful, only it was quite hit and miss. And so that's now being undertaken in other states, you know, uh, far larger than what we did. And um, we don't do that anymore. As soon as the wombat's got mange, we catch the wombat, we bring them in and uh, we treat them and then we can release them back into the wild because in three days, they are completely different animal. And I've just put a video up actually on our Facebook page to show the change, which is so quickly, but generally people euthanize them. And uh, there's, it stops the whole learning process. So what we're trying to do is um, start educating people that we're these animals, but the environment needs to be looked at. I'll just treating um, for three years in a row we treated animals um, to the point that there was no more mange. And then I got a phone call from one of the local residents and said that uh, all the wombats are, the burrows are gone. <laughs> and so I went out there and the farmer, these animals were on public land. The farmer had pushed through the fence with his tractor, destroying his fence. He had filled the warrens up with phosphotoxin, which is a gas that's illegal to use on wombats. Then he'd fill the holes with um, boulders so the wombats could not get out and then he completely covered them all with dirt so that they could not dig out. And uh, he was let off saying that he thought about rabbit warrens and despite the, the size of the burrows. But what we found out later is that every year he was poisoning these animals and it wasn't enough to kill them but it was enough to stress them and that was what was actually causing the mange. So there's you know so many problems for these animals in regards to um, what actually causes the mange. So in the United States, um, I've lived in the Western United States, in rural Western United States, for pretty much my whole life, and the there is an overwhelming hatred of wolves among, especially ranchers, and in the in the the, the I grew up in the in the plains. Uh, and uh, there is an overwhelming hatred by farmers and ranchers of prairie dogs, and both of those are completely—they're completely non-rational. Um, yeah. And I didn't know this before we started talking, but it's sounding to me like there is a completely non-rational hatred. Um, I guess what some people would call excess repression. Um, a, a, a hatred of wombats that goes beyond simple economics of of them being annoyed because they're eating supposedly eating their grass or something. Yes, 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 so, yes, I, yes. Can you talk about that hatred for a minute? I can. Um, we actually started um, getting friends with um, with some farmers and they're very intelligent people and. Um, and they gave us a really good insight because they said that the wombats aren't the problem, they're a symptom of the problem. So we have a very high suicide rate uh, within the farmers within this, uh, this region. And uh, it's mainly due to trying to farm in an area that is really not uh, viable. And uh, if they can't control the weather, they try to control everything on their property. And it is an old mindset that wombats are going to take over. And in actual fact, we've found that the people that do cull have the greatest problem with wombats and population boom. And uh, we've learned in our sanctuary, because we were trying to work out a way of how we were going to manage the breeding in our sanctuary, because we, at this stage, we really don't want to breed them because there are so many animals in trouble that we keep on coming to us. And uh, we had this, we've got two dominant females. They're both blind, we both come from the wild. And they were just so awful with trying to introduce new wombats. Just really aggressive. They would not accept them. And it just made it really hard for us to keep on taking in all of these adult wombats. So our, our dominant female, um, we decided to build her a separate area by herself. And so we removed her and we popped her in there by herself. And um, after 14 days, there was absolute indiscriminate mating. They were, they were mating on the veranda, on the driveway, everywhere you looked there was wombats mating. And thankfully when I worked in a zoo, and I saw this happening with kangaroos when we removed the dominant male, and so we put her back in and there was normal social order. 
So what we worked out with this, and we we this is how we manage our population now. We have 46 wombats in care at the moment. Is that uh, she's the dominant female? Is always the first to eat. So she comes up and comes inside at night, and and she'll eat, and she goes off when she comes into season. We don't see her, so that's when we know to, to separate her. So she gets separated for 10 days, which is her season. If we leave her for more than 14 days, hell, hell breaks loose. But if we put her back in within that period of time, that's how we regulate the population. And now it takes us at least 12 to 18 months to introduce a new adult wombat. So when you relay that in the wild, if they're destroying the dominant female, She's the one that's keeping all of the new wombats from entering into the population. She's also controlling all of the breeding and she's absolutely vital in the management of these animals. And that is why we have seen so many properties that don't cull have stable populations for 50 years, 100 years, and the people that do cull are whinging and complaining about the uncontrollable population boom. That sounds very similar to both mountain lions, well, not similar, but analogous to mountain lions and um, coyotes, both of whom oh. go, it's, it's counterintuitive that if you start killing them off, you actually end up with more of them. It's, it's a very strange yes. thing. Um, yes. so, so let's talk about reproduction in general and talk about social structures. There's, yes. um, let's just talk basics first, like how, 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 who, who has babies and how many and how often? Okay, well, the southern hairy nose wombat, they have, they need three good consecutive years of rainfall before they'll have a baby, a joey, and they'll have one joey every three years. So in their whole lifetime, they're lucky to have two or three joeys, and there's a 10% survival rate of those babies to reach adulthood. But they're very slow breeders. Um, the bare nose wombats, they have one generally every two years, and they don't, uh, they don't have that big, strong, strong social structure, and uh, the joeys also don't seem to stay with them as long as what, uh, as what the southern hairy nose wombats do. So with the southern hairy nose, how, much, how long do they live? Uh, 14 in the wild, 35 in captivity. Okay, so if... if they have a baby only after three good years of rain and they will have I'm sorry how many per per per, per, per pregnancy just one just one, just one. Yeah. and and then how let's say that it's really good rain for many years in a row how long after they have a baby do they have another one you said three years Usually again two, two to three years yes depending on when the um, the, uh, the little girl will leave Generally, if it's a little girl, she'll stay around a lot longer, two to three years, or become part of their family, and uh, and uh, that's what actually delays the um, the breeding process. So they will not breed again until that baby's left. And is it typical in wild warrens for the mat the matriarch or the 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 mother of them all to? to sort of control breeding in that way so that the other females also don't breed? Is it is the entire colony reproducing very, very, very slowly? Well, we don't know. We don't know. We can only... They are so secretive. No one knows anything about these animals. And that's why, because we essentially have a sanctuary, um, well, all of the ones that are, that are trying to mate and breeding and... Uh, they are all, they've all come from the wild. They've all come from the wild as adults, and they all live as wild animals. Wild animals. Um, we only put food out for them so that we can see them, because otherwise we simply don't see them. They are that secretive, and so this is how we've got to understand what's actually happening. We can only relay, relay that to the wild, but I, I don't feel that there's any way that anyone could possibly um, be able to work this out in the wild. So, we had a film crew come. Sorry. No, go ahead, please. Uh, we had a film crew come across from uh, from Germany wanting to film the wombats and um, they tried for six months and they set up cameras 300 metres from their warrens and in four days all the wombats moved. So they just had no luck and that's when they started, that's when they did the documentary within the sanctuary. So in the, in the wild, you've used the word secretive. It sounds also, are they also timid or is this because, is this because they've been shot so much that they're just smart and they leave? Uh, I think it's a combination of both. We can't drive a diesel car in, in their habitat at all because you will not see any. So we have to drive a petrol car. 
but they are extremely timid animals. And it's hard to leave because they've got such bold personalities. But when it comes to people, I think it's probably just ingrained in them to run and hide because they have been shot so much. And it sounds to me like with a creature who is who reproduces so slowly that pre-conquest they must not have had. Who are who are their enemies? Why would a wombat die once it became an adult five hundred years ago? Uh, yeah. Well, it was only which tailed eagles. They were the only threat. And aside from um, being hunters for food, but that was, you know, quite insignificant. So that was it. So, the, so they once they reached adulthood, they probably had decent. They had they had low rates of mortality then, because there can't be yes. that many eagles. Yes. No, just it was purely climatic changes, and that's what we've seen throughout European history of what's actually happened to the animal. It's just been drought, drought. And that, that, is, that is what controls the population. So before we talk about that, um, yeah. well, let's talk about that and then talk about their intelligence and personality later. So, okay. so t tell me more about the, you've mentioned mange, direct shooting, and pet trade, zoo trade, um, what other... Oh, and hunting for food. I don't remember if I already mentioned that. So what are the threats? You, you just mentioned climate. The climate is probably um, underneath the, uh, the, the human, inter the human um, destruction. That would be, you know, pretty high up there. I think that in 1990, we had a huge drought, and I think it saw 90% of certain populations killed. Um, so that is, you know, nature has its ways, and I guess... Um, and so we haven't seen that since, but I have seen a huge decline due to poor land management. And what do you mean by poor land management? Um, it's just where the, the farmers have tried to farm land that is not suitable for farming, and then they've destroyed the seed bank and left the... And I'm talking a huge amount of land. I'm talking at least a million acres that have been destroyed, which is the prime habitat for wombats. And... When I say it's bad, it is really bad. I just walk up and pick up wombats that are just lying on their side eating dirt because that's all that they've got to eat. It is, uh, it's, it's been catastrophic for this population. And how, how are wombats doing who are uh, fairly far away from any farming lands are they are they also are there populations that you know of obviously very secretive it's very hard to tell but are those populations uh also suffering or are they doing okay i don't know of any that are not uh in trouble at all and i don't know any that aren't on farming land even the conservation parks has had all of the weeds and the crops blow onto their properties and they cannot keep up with it. There's a, there's a weed called onion weed that we have down here, and it has just taken their habitat by storm, and it's toxic, and they've got nothing else to eat, and uh, that's all throughout the conservation parks now, and the, the uh, managers cannot keep up with it. They have hundreds of people onto it, and they still can't keep up with it, and uh, the population is just going, going, gone, even on the conservation parks. Wow, this is, this is, this is just dreadful. Um... So what other threats, I mean, as if that isn't enough, are there other threats to them? No, uh, aside from, um, well, there's, there's the culling, the legal culling, and then there's the illegal culling. So there's a lot of people that um, go up and shoot them for fun. And it's really sad because quite often if you've got a petrol car, the wombats will walk up to the car and, you know, just sniff around the car and walk off and people shoot them. And so we've got a lot of wombats that have been shot and, uh, and we've just found them, you know, dying on the side of the road. So that's, that's another issue that they have. But, uh, but I think, you know, the, the climatic changes and the culling of the oh, disease are the biggest ones for them. They really are. There's, there is no way are these animals going to last you know, a long period of time. I think, you know, I give them 20 years and they'll be in the same position as the, uh, the Northern Herring Earth Wombat. Well, thank you for starting your work before they get to the Northern Hairy Nosed Wombat Territory because I, I think it's, as soon as you start to see a decline from a still significant population, that's when we really need to put, put in the effort. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, 
tell me more about their personalities and uh, intelligence and just what they're like. They are just the most they are the most amazing animals. They are full of self love for themselves. They're full of their own confidence. They are really clear in their communication of what they want. They don't like being told what to do. And yet they live in this big social family group where they cuddle each other and they look after each other. And and um, I was speaking to a doctor the other week who said the more... Because there is a huge um, difference in intellect between the bare-nosed wombat and the hairy-nosed wombat. And, and he said the more social the animals are, the higher their intelligence is. And so I never actually knew that beforehand. But with these babies, they, they suck their thumb when they're sad, they smile when they're happy, they understand words, um, they, uh, they've got um, just such a playful, full of life um, personality. And also, you know, they come in, the thing that amazes me the most is that we rescue these animals and they weigh 20% of their body weight. People thought that we were mad trying to save these animals because the, the, the largest adult we've had in her body measurement, she should have been 30, 31 kilos, and she came in at 6.3 kilos, skin and bone, and yet they recover and they respond to care so well. And she was in care for two years before she um, got back up on her feet and got her confidence about going outside. We just never see her again. She lives within the sanctuary, but she's just retu- returned back to that wild state because her instinct is so strong. And so it's just, uh, it's just for me, they have so many human traits that I think really are starting to get people interested in them and, and people are starting to be able to re- relate to them as well as them being completely, totally, and utterly gorgeous. And let's say you have a, that one warren you said, I'm sorry, it covered 500 acres? Yes. Okay, so how far would wombats go beyond that 500 acres to to eat do they do they go another mile do they go another 100 yards well their range is only about five acres and it just depends on the food source so uh when we released our wombats at our last sanctuary they would they could come and go do whatever they want but they didn't go further than 150 meters from their warren their warren is their is their home it's everything to them so they purely only go out to eat and that's it their whole social life, everything is, is underground. And do they do they do they poop inside, or do they go outside to poop too? Uh, in the sanctuary inside at our place? No, no, no. In the warrens. In, in the burrow. Um, well, I see them digging out um, bits of poo, but most of the time they'll go out and poo under a tree. And they must. How, how do they dig? They must have incredibly strong legs to dig these huge. Long walls. They are amazing. Their legs are about 15 centimetres long, and they're about that round. <laughs> and they dig, and then they, they've got a, a soft, well, a hard cartilage pallet in their bottom. So they dig with their front legs, and then they use their bum like a shovel and actually push the dirt out that way. But in saying that, they're not prolific diggers. They dig their warrens, but you only see a bit of a clean out once or twice a year because they conserve their energy as much as possible. And it's stunning to me that, I mean, delightful, this is wonderful, that they have communities that you, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounded like you were saying that huge warren was there for hundreds of years, for Oh, thousands. It is so, they, some of their warrens are so old, and there's pictures, Aboriginal drawings of them uh, on a local cave. You know, they're very, very, very old warrens. And that breaks my heart even more to see some of those bulldozed or, you know, otherwise destroyed. Yes, but there was this beautiful population and it had the biggest burrows I have ever seen in my life. We could walk in them for about 30 metres and they were just perched on the side of a hill. It was crown land, nobody used this land and I used to go there every six months to go and check on them and and um, and I went, oh, I went there and the whole lot of warrens was collapsed. So anatomically wombats can dig up but they simply can't. So the amount of sand that they put on those warrens, those babies would have been trapped and buried alive. And there was no need for it at all because they were not bothering anyone. 
the land was not suitable or used for anything. It was on the side of a hill and it was only a small patch of land. And I, I don't understand that because that is so much history, let alone the lives that have been lost within that small community there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's... We, we, the whole world has gotten outraged that... Um, that ISIS, for example, has been destroying museums and pieces of art around the world. But I say, yes. shoot, you know, this is yes. this is this is this is the same thing. This is destroying these yes. ancient communities. Um, yes, that's really beautifully said. Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, so, tell me more about the sanctuary. How did it start, and then? Walk me through uh, the process that somebody that, that, that from from hearing about a wombat to the final time you ever see it. Okay. Okay. Um, so I used to work in zoos. I've, I've spent most of my adult life working in zoos, and and I always looked after wombats in zoos. And then when I had to when I I had to look after an orphan one an orphan baby and uh, the, the breeding captivity, they never breed in captivity, but this pair breed. And we, um, I found her at four o'clock in the morning scraping the jelly out of the pouch. And I sat, sat with her for hours and she didn't want that baby anymore because she was hand raised, she didn't know what she was doing. And so I took that baby and within three hours, my life changed. This baby didn't even have his eyes open, but there was something magic about them. It's like everything in my life came together. And the more I looked after him, the more I realized what an injustice it was of how these animals are kept in captivity. And I was so distraught at the concept of him going back into that life that that was it. I, um, it took me no time at all to get the properties on the market to leave the family and friends. And, and I ended up buying a block off the internet because I was that that all my logic went out the window. <laughs> and I bought this awful property off the internet that it got me down to South Australia and it got him out of any chance of having to be going back into captivity. And, uh, and from my work in zoos, and I thought they always had to be kept separate. And, um, and so I built, you know, separate enclosures for them and, and that lasted less than a few months because there were so many animals that needed help and it wasn't really my intention to start rescuing to the state extent of what I did. Um, but they came in hard and fast and, and uh, they showed me pretty quickly that they live communally. They don't want to be kept separate. And they would just peel tin off, you know, steel posts to get in together. And um, so it's been a, it was a very gradual process um, because the block, the block that we bought, they couldn't dig burrows on because the limestone shelf was so thick. So we moved to another area and we got another sanctuary for them. And that's when we really became free range and we really understood the concept um, of how what it does to them to put them into cages and how that destroys their trust and destroys their will to live so we don't ever put them in cages. And, uh, and that's when we started having to look at how we're going to manage the population. And so they have been the biggest teachers for us. And the way that they come in is so varied. Quite often we will be driving along, we'll see a dying wombat, we'll jump out of the car and catch it as it's running down their burrow. And then we make the assessment as to whether or not the animal can be returned to the wild. So we, just, we have a look at so many different key factors. Is the habitat viable? Why did they come into care? Were they shot? Were they starving to death? Did they have mange? What are the likelihood of them going back into the wild and ending up in the same situation? And uh, the, the thing that I have with these animals is that I don't just love the one, it is the whole species. I feel just as passionately about a wombat that I have not met as what I do about one that I've hand raised. And it's something that I can't change and I've tried really hard to change it and it doesn't work. So, um, so that's why we've, we've built this big sanctuary now and how we work with the animals to try and assimilate them into the, into the community and we support them all the way through the community and literally until they die, they don't go anywhere else if we make that decision that they're going to live with us. And, um, and we just go through every effort that we can to try and help an animal that, uh, you know, help an animal that needs, needs the help and whether or not it's to be released back into the wild or whether or not it's to come into captivity or come into the sanctuary, then we support them through that individually. 
And let's say that one is going to be released back in the wild. That would be back to yeah. where, like, they came that, from. and that would be like you see one that's hit by a car, you bring it in until its leg heals, and then, yes. uh, and then you put it back out. Just yes, by law, we've only uh -huh. got four weeks four weeks before we can release them and that's because they lose their territory. Once they've lost that ter their territory and and their whole social structure is changed within their family group, they don't get accepted back in. So what happens is that animal gets pushed out from territory to territory to territory until it runs itself to death. It's also exposed to extreme climatic conditions which they're not designed for. They're designed for cool temperatures. And uh, and so, you know, we have had other people that have released these animals and literally watched them run themselves to death. So that's why we're really careful about what happens and we always have to release them back to where they've come from as long as they've got that four-week period. Now, if we wanted to do soft release, what we would have to do, and that would be extremely successful, but it's really complicated because the animals have to come back by law. They have to go back to where they came from. So what we would have to do is we know it takes them 12 months to establish a territory. So we would have to build them a soft-release enclosure with temperature-controlled environment unless there's an empty wire in there. Then those animals would have to be fed every day for 12 months. And then eventually, after the 12 months, we could start opening up the fence to let them still have their worm, but to come and go and, and eventually assimilate into the wild population. So it's their social structure that actually stops us from being able to release them. So how would, in, in, insofar as we know, how would, um, let's pretend it's a thousand years ago or something, how would... Uh, the 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 young adults. How would they make a new a new warren? How how does that? Who well, who leaves and what happens still. to them? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the females generally stay within that family group. The new the little boys, the juvenile boys, from when they're really small, usually about four kilograms, they're out starting to dig their new warren. And so then they eventually take that over. A lot of the young males are kicked out of their territory and have to move on. And that's when I get a lot of reports of people seeing, you know, young males. Well, a lot of farmers just shoot them as they see them walking around looking for a new, a new burrow. So that the males have a pretty low survival rate um, in the wild, and that's, you know, essentially how it always has been. And how, obviously, a male can't make a new uh, warren by himself. So how do the females end up leaving the old warren ever? Well, I don't think the females leave the warren at all. And uh, the babies, the, the juvenile boys, they start digging the new warrens. It, the adults do not create new warrens at all. That is the baby's job, the baby boy's job, and um, and that's what we've seen also, which affects with the culling, is when they've got the population increase, and then they've got the new joeys, and the new boys, and then the boys go out and start digging new wines. And then it all goes downhill from there. Is that what you're trying to get at? Is that um, the females generally don't make their own warrens? We find that it's the, the juvenile males that dig the new warrens. So when he makes a new warren, Obviously, it's some, for there to be more wombats, at some point a female has to show up. So yes. does he, he basically prepare it, and then how does it, how, what, how does it happen that a female well, leaves the, the old one? Okay, it's still within a neighboring community. So obviously they all live communally, but their warren is their home and their territory. So this baby will probably, um, I've seen them sometimes only 10 meters away from the warren. He'll start digging his own new burrow. And then, uh, obviously, he'll meet a girl, or as he moves up in the ranks, he'll start pushing the older males out. The older males go into these uh, the other small warrens that have already been created. And uh, you'll see in extreme temperatures, the dominant, the healthy, they all go into these, um, into these, we call them nuclear warrens, the large warrens, and then all of the old and the young get pushed out into these little tiny burrows that surround the nuclear warrens. And so that's what happens is they move their way up through the cycle social system. So really what I'm getting at is wombats expand their territory at a glacial rate. Yes. Um, 
Because like salmon, you know, salmon all come back to the same stream, except it ends up that only 95% or 97% or something like that actually go back to the stream. And actually 5% of the salmon are really inquisitive, and they can go somewhere completely different. So they can actually... Oh, they can expand their range um, very, very, very quickly. Um, Wow. Yeah, so it sounds like, on the other hand, um, this, this is yet another concern for me because... It sounds like for them to recover will take, because of slow reproductive rate and slow rate of expansion of territory, it will take, even if even if every other risk factor was taken away, it would take, making a number up, a thousand years for them to get back to what they were. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh. There's only, um, there's, biologically, there's only 110 years difference between... Um, the two extents of the population. So the, the Nullarpur population, the furthest population away is the Murray lands. So in 110 years, they have been completely, totally and utterly fragmented um, to a point that there is, you know, there's, there's no chance for them to come back from that. Right. I want to mention one more thing before we start to wind down, which is it's very interesting to me that the young males are the ones who build the new warrens and have a high rate of mortality because it makes me think of honeybees and honeybees have different roles during their lives when they're young they're nurse bees they're, they nurse other bees and then they become guards and then after that they become foragers and then after that they come become scouts and the point is every one of those jobs is more dangerous than the one before and also they have left life left so it's it's actually a it would be a complete waste of energy to take the the young bees to put them on a dangerous job because they still have 30 days of flying left that they can do. And from a wombat perspective, it's so interesting to me that the young males are the least important reproductively and also then that the wombat community over the millennia has chosen them to do the most dangerous job. Yes. Yes. That's, mm. that's pretty fascinating. Very. Um, so, so we have about five minutes left, and um, a, a couple questions. Uh, the first one is, so things are obviously pretty grim, and if, if they made you tomorrow the, the queen of all things wombat, and, <laughs> um, and you, were, you could do, basically, you could put in place any policies you want, except you can't get rid of capitalism or civilization on the first week. You can do that in the week two or something. <laughs> um, so you, the point is you can't, you can't get rid of the whole system right now, which you and I both know is pretty destructive. But leave that yeah. aside. What, what, would you, what policies imp- would you implement to help them given the constraints of the current system? I would obviously can, can, the bar- the, can the culling. That would be the first thing because there's just so many animals being killed that uh, it's just so unnecessary. And I would implement a system um, for... Um, for uh, I want to introduce a more about accreditation. So if all the companies knew that were buying the products from these farmers knew what was actually happening to these animals and knew how cruel... Um, the culling was, and I haven't even touched the illegal culling to the extent of what they actually do to these animals, um, then uh, the only way we could stop it, even if the government banned culling tomorrow, the farmers would still do it because there's really isolated areas. So the only way we can, we can actually stop this is to get them in the hip pocket to say, okay, if you want to still have someone to buy these products, you need to stop culling wombats. In order to do that, you need to, need to be accredited. So your property gets evaluated each year that you are still doing the right thing by these animals. And I think that would be the biggest move towards them. And, and then, of course, it would be, obviously, revegetation of their habitat. And I think those two things alone would make such a significant difference to these animals and would stop the, the rapid decrease very, very quickly. So... Um Tell me what's your website and also tell me how – I'm going to have one more question after this. Tell me your website and tell me how people can directly support your work. And my next – my final question is going to be how can they support wombats in general. So first, like your website and the name of your sanctuary. Okay. Our website is wombatawareness.com. You can follow us on Facebook, which is Wombat Awareness Organization. And – 
and the, the best way that they can help is um, by getting on board on our Facebook and to be able to share things because knowledge is power and the more support these animals have, the better they're going to come across because, uh, you know, to date there's been no one standing up for them. We're the first people that have come in and said, look, this is really wrong and we're not going anywhere and we're going to change things. So that's where we really need people's support. Well, thank you. Is there anything you want to say either about wombats or about your work that I haven't given you opportunity? I don't think so. I think you've been um, really generous with your coverage. Um, we, we are trying to secure a sanctuary for uh, the wombat because eventually we would like to increase it where they have a huge wild protected area um, because our services are pretty high for demand at the moment and, and it's not... It's not going backwards. It's actually getting more and more and more. And so we're trying to secure our very first sanctuary. Um, we've only been leasing properties and, and we've found our dream property. And so we're really going to be pushing that soon because we're not looking for people to donate. We're looking for people to contribute, to give us a loan to actually um, step into this property, which is um, pretty amazing and, and really vital for these animals because, to be honest, we're really at capacity um, inside uh, at the moment and uh, and so in that way we do need a lot of help I, I guess and, and I, I hope people help and in I guess I do have one more question which is yes. um, how if someone wanted to replicate your work either to help yes. wombats or or to help any other creature what yes. I'm going to back up one second and say uh, you, you today have you, you're one of my heroes because um, the distinction is between the big distinction is not between those who believe we need to bring everything down and those who believe in working within the system. None of that. The big distinction is between those who do nothing and those who do something. And yes. I love the fact that you saw a problem and instead of just complaining to all your friends about wow this is a terrible problem. You got off your butt and did something. So, yes. so what? If somebody either wants to help wombats or wants to help uh, giant salamanders, I mean, it doesn't matter. No, what, yeah. what? What advice would you give them to 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 really help get them, spur them to action? Um, I think that the relationship with yourself is more important than anything. So if you have a good relationship with yourself, you've got the courage to stand up and do something that you really want to do. And um, I have so many people go, oh, I really wanted to do this, but then this happened. And it, rather than taking on the challenge to go, this happened, but I found a way through it, um, and that's what helps you grow as a person and makes you be more determined and, and helps you actually live. Because a lot of people don't live, they just exist. And then doing something that you really want to do makes you come alive and, and brings fire and love and, and everything that everyone looks for into their life. So I, I, I would say to people that if there's something that you really want to do and you've got a really good relationship with yourself, then everything will fall into place perfectly. And, and don't let, the, don't let the, um, the bumps in the road stop you from following what you really want to do. Well, thank you so much. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Bridget Stevens. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.